Hey everybody, welcome to ARE Live. I'm Mark Tier, the founder of Black Spectacles, and today I'm with Mike Newman and Frank Heitzman, and we're gonna talk about the process for how to become a licensed architect. Uh, specifically, we're really gonna kind of get into the IDP and you know what the ARE is. <clears throat> So we'll start uh, by talking uh, about the education requirements. Um, we'll continue, as I mentioned, um, with a deep dive into the, into the intern development program or the IDP, and then we'll discuss what the architect registration or the ARE um, exam is and how to plan to pass it. So, uh, but before we get started, uh, if you would like to attend our next ARE live broadcast, uh, which will focus on our construction documents and services mock exam, you can visit blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register. Um, and during the broadcast, just like today, you'll have a chance to ask questions to the group uh, and with Mike. Uh, now, if you don't know Mike, he's an adjunct professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He's also the founder of Shed Studio, and he is the instructor for Black Spectacles online AIA ARE prep curriculum, uh, which if you haven't already checked out our AIA ARE prep curriculum, you can head over to blackspectacles.com to watch any of the free tutorials from those courses. <coughs> And today we're also uh, very lucky to have Frank Heitzman with us. Um, he is the founding principal of Heitzman Architects. He's also a senior lecturer at Triton College, and he is a longtime licensing advisor for the state of Illinois. Um, so he knows all about the IDP and ARE, and frankly, I think, uh, Frank, you taught me everything that I, I knew or needed to know uh, back when I was working on this. So it's pretty cool to have you here, of course. Um, so yeah, so we have Frank as well today. So. Um, and then also at the end of our session, we have a, a special Black Spectacles promo code that I'd like to share, so stay tuned to hear about that at the end. Um, but first, I'm going to go ahead and uh, hand it over to Mike. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, <laughs> as Mark said, uh, today we'll be discussing the sort of basic basics of the process, how to literally get started and what the heck is the license process anyway. Uh, there are essentially a few simple categories that we'll be discussing, as Mark mentioned, this sort of uh, idea of education, um, experience, and then the examination. And these are essentially a fairly simple process. Um, the, for most folks, the simple aspects of it will work just fine. Um, now it's easy for me to say, it's just money and time. <laughs> um, but. Uh, for a few people, um, there'll be snags along the way. And so those snags along the way can be really big problem. There's nothing worse than working for a few years, uh, than figuring out that you're not eligible uh, and have to start over. So uh, let's try to help that not to happen. Uh, so as Mark said, today we have our, uh, our expert uh, in the house, Frank Heitzman. Um, Frank was a young man teaching uh, this material back uh, when I was going through the process uh, many, many years ago. And uh, the two of us have uh, kind of uh, been doing this back and forth for quite a long time. Uh, and he's, uh, he's definitely the go-to guy uh, on these topics uh, as far as uh, I'm concerned. Uh, so um, uh, I, think, I think we're sort of ready to jump in and start uh, chatting away. Well, thanks, Mike, for inviting me. I'm pleased to be here and to help out as many interns as I can get through this process. It looks on the surface to be extremely complicated, but in reality it's pretty simple. There's three steps. <clears throat> get an education, go through an internship, take and pass the ARE, and you become licensed in any state in the United States and any province in Canada. That's, so uh, That sounds so easy. How, it sounds how hard easy. can this be? It sounds easy, but it's, uh, uh, it is a process that you have to go through, and of course Number one thing that you should do is to sign up for the IDP if you haven't done that already, regardless of what your educational uh, experience or your educational completion is. You can sign up for IDP as soon as you graduate from high school and begin earning intern credits, experience credits, toward the total number that you need, the 3,740 hours that you need <coughs> um, to supplement your education. And internship is a process of learning by doing. And that's the whole idea behind it. Uh, you learn the theory in, in school, and you learn the practice in practice, in working for an architect. And that kind of speaks to the history of all of this as well. Like uh, kind of the early days of architectural uh, licensure was really all about being in a, through, going through an apprentice process. And so it was kind of getting right. that experience in the field working for somebody who was already an established architect. 
That's true. When I uh, was in school, I was working for a, uh, an architect in my, near my hometown down in southern Illinois. And he was telling me at that time that there were many architects that he knew that didn't even go to school. They simply went to work for an architect for eight years. They were able to take the licensing exam and pass it, and then they became uh, architects. And he always kind of turned his nose up at those people because they didn't have the full educational experience that he had, that he went through. And, and uh, so it, it almost was a uh, divided, pr uh, divided profession in those days, those that had been to school and those that hadn't been to school. And so then along the way, there was sort of a decision made to kind of formalize this and, and make it more of a, a specific process. Well, yeah, the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards, which represents all of the licensing authorities in the 55 jurisdictions in the United States, 50 states and five uh, territories, you might say, including Washington, D.C., um, that was organized back in the 60s, and there, there was a kind of a Wild West attitude toward licensing before then that every state was on its own. And for the longest time, Illinois was the first state to require uh, professional registration to become an architect. Other states just let anybody who wanted to. In fact, Daniel Burnham, <laughs> Daniel Burnham was trained in pharmacy. I don't know if you know that or not, but he never, he never actually got a degree in architecture. But yet he ran one of the biggest architectural firms in Chicago. But there was a, um, a movement in Illinois to try to become uh, more professionalized in the approach to practice. And that spread throughout the country, but it was still every state was on its own. So NCARB, as it's called, the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards, um, figured out that there ought to be a regular way of doing it so that if an architect in Illinois should be able to practice in Wisconsin and Indiana and Missouri and, and Michigan and other states that, that they uh, uh, were um, uh, getting jobs in. And so their, their process became the standard process that's used throughout the country. And every state has accepted this process, including Illinois. So there's a, a bunch of aspects of this that are the same throughout the country. It doesn't really matter what you do. The exam is essentially the same. There's a few add-on parts in a few states, but essentially it's the same exam everywhere, for example. But there's still kind of a legacy of different states having uh, some of their own, like it's, it's the jurisdiction is by state. Yeah, every, every state national. has its own licensing laws, but those laws have become pretty standardized. The state of California, for example, has an additional exam that you have to take that relates to their state building code. And you have to know things about earthquake resistant design, for example, and, and other things that are peculiar to California. But virtually all the other states have a standardized methodology. Illinois is a little bit unique in the sense that um, they take a long time to make adjustments to the new regulations that are suggested by NCARB. NCARB provides advice to the states, but the states don't have to take them necessarily. And so Illinois is a little bit behind the other states in terms of the shortening of the internship period, for example. I, I don't know if you know that or not, Mike, but um, NCARB has passed a um, uh, resolution that allows interns to only um, earn 3,740 credits as opposed to 5,160. Yeah. Uh, and they reduce that by taking out the supplemental um, the supplemental uh, practice requirements, which are not really true practice. You can get supplemental experience in Illinois, for, for example, by doing the uh, Emerging Professionals Companion, which is a series of case studies that the AI has produced. And you read those, you answer the questions at the end, and you submit them, and you get credit for it. But that's a, that's that's a sort of far like, distance yeah. from practice. It's more like a continuing education. It is. That, that's basically like that. what it is. So they will eliminate NCARB is recommending that states eliminate that. Illinois hasn't done that yet, for good reasons. I don't know if I need to go into what those reasons are, but there's a lot of reasons for it. But they will uh, very soon. And most of the states are kind of on board with Virtually all the other states are Virtually, on board. Yeah. <laughs> Way to go, Illinois, always on top of this. Yeah, right. uh, yeah. But, but there are still, like one of the things that I'm sure we'll mention a couple of times in this hour is the idea that uh, you really do have to check with your states um, uh, licensing board to make sure that you're following very good the s very specific issues. Very good point. Well, yes. generally everything will be very similar and pretty much everything we talk about will be uh, applicable uh, across the country and in uh, um, some other related, uh, in Canada, for example, is a very similar process. Um, 
So there, you want to talk specifics. about you want to talk about the various flavors of education that exist? Yeah, out there? let's talk about that. Um, so okay, the first thing to say is uh, when they when NCARB says you need to get a uh, an education, they're specifically talking about uh, an NAAB uh, accredited program. So that's going to be a BARC, which most of us think of as a five year program, uh, an MARC, uh, which is either a three-year program or a combination of two-year plus uh, some other elements. Yeah, it would be either a four plus two, which is the standard way of doing it, four years of pre-professional education and architecture by schools that have that program, and then two years of, of a graduate level program. Uh, or four plus three, which allows people who do not attend an architectural school in their undergraduate degree, get a degree in music or history or English or whatever, and then go to uh, the architectural school and study for three years. So it's compacting. And intense. intense very intense three, years, three yes. years. That's what I did. So I, I, I think of it as very intense. Well, it gives you a well-rounded education because you get uh, a good ba a background in uh, the humanities, which you typically don't get in a five-year program, right. hardly any humanities at all. And you get very few of them in a four plus two. So the four plus three is the better program if you can stand to be in school for seven years. For seven years. Yeah. I remember when I reached my fifth year in in the uh, five year bachelor of architecture program, I was about ready to to <laughs> get right. done at the beginning of that, that yes. first year. Seven well, years is year. A, a long a long <laughs> haul. And then the third one on this particular list is the Doctor of Architecture DARC. Um, that's actually very rare. There's, it's more common now than it's ever been, but. Um, that's not something that would be like a normal process that people would go through. Yeah, it's I think there's specific... only one DARC degree that's accredited, and that's the one in Hawaii. Yeah. There are a lot of other DARC degrees out there, but oh, they're, they're not accredited. accredited. Yeah. I mean, to be a DARC, you almost would have to have been an MARC, I would imagine. I should, so you probably... I should also mention that there are one year MARC programs out there, but you need to be aware of those because there are no one year programs that are accredited. Therefore, people who already have a Bachelor of Architecture degree, which would be an accredited degree, that just want to get another year of education, maybe they want to specialize in something, and, and they can go to a school that has that program, but they are not accredited. And but some of those have like a, like a health specialty or something right, like or that. Right, or history. I went through the history program, the one-year B-Arch, uh, M-Arch after um, the yeah. five-year B-Arch. But that's a good word of warning uh, to watch out for those. Make sure yeah, so that it fits with your If you like going to school, that would be a good thing to do, but it doesn't gain you anything in terms of credits uh, for licensing. It doesn't give you any additional IDP credit either. It used to, but not anymore. <laughs> uh, so just to kind of be clear about it then, the, the ones that don't count, um, at least not by themselves, are the BS, the Bachelor of Science, uh, or the BA degrees. Uh, yeah, they call it BS in Architectural Studies, Bachelor of Science in Architectural Studies, or Bachelor of Arts in Architectural Studies, BSAS or BAAS. Um, they, they are offered by many, many schools. Uh, UIC offers one, University of Illinois down in Champaign-Urbana offers one, All over SIU the country, yeah. Carbondale offers one, and I've had interns call me up and say, oh, I, have a, I have a degree in architecture, but I can't get licensed. <laughs> I said, well, they didn't tell you that you need a professional degree in order to become licensed when you were in school. And, and they those... Said, oh, Want my money back? Right. So those programs are great programs. <laughs> they are. If yeah. if you know that you're going to be going on and They're doing great the two-year program for, after for the continuation into the Master of Architecture degree, which is the real professional degree. Now I should say that there are many many students out there who have graduated in the BSAS. I know that because I get a lot of calls from them, and um, you cannot be licensed in most of the states with a BSAS degree or a BAAS degree. Um, you have to go on and get a, a professional degree. Now, <clears throat> what happens, there are some states that do allow a four-year degree, including Wisconsin. So I've talked to students that say, well, you know, it's getting to the end of the year now, and, and I know that Illinois has stopped accepting uh, four-year degrees for licensure. What should I do? And is this a good time to talk about this, Mike? Sure. You want to yeah. continue with it? Because it relates to education. So what should I do? And the answer is there are two paths for you. Number one, you can go ahead and, and continue your education and get a master's degree, which would be an additional two years uh, in most schools, or SIU in Carbondale, Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, is offering a <clears throat> one-year, 15-month, actually, 15-month, 
Master of Architecture degree. It's an intensive degree, uh, and it's all online. Yeah. You only have to attend, I believe, two sessions for a week, and they strategically schedule those sessions for a normal spring break time. And so there's a you, few of those around the country. Them. I think there's I think there's one in in Lawrence. I think um, is that right? I didn't I know. I think about so, Lawrence, and I think there's one okay. in at the. Uh, BAC in the Boston, Boston Architectural yeah. College. Yeah. Um, and so and I know there's at least those two and I think but there's the maybe a few others. But the one that's close by here is, that I know about yeah. is, is SIUC, Southern Illinois University of Carbondale. <clears throat> and it's relatively easy to get into. You do not need a portfolio, for example, which you do at many other schools. Now, the cost is $25,000 flat fee, which sounds like a lot of money, but if you compare it to a residency at another school for two years and the fact that you're going to be losing income because you're not working during those two years, you're attending school full time, then it's really a bargain. So that's that's the one path <clears throat> to get the Master of Architecture degree. Now what if you say, well I can't go back to school, I don't have the money, I can't go to a school, first of all they won't let me in because my grades were dismal <laughs> in <laughs> undergraduate school, so what do I do? Okay. Here's what you do for the second path. You, decide, you finish your IDP, and then you apply for the architectural registration examination. You take it. They'll let you take it, even though you don't have a professional degree. Pass the architectural registration examination and ask to be licensed in one of the 21 states that still allows licensure with a BSAS or a BAAS four-year degree. Wisconsin is one of those. They're very convenient to us here. I know there are people from all around the country. There's, there's lots of other states. New York is one. California is one where you don't need a professional degree. And it's kind of interesting to me to know that the largest states, with the exception of Illinois, which is a very large state, and we have lots of architects here, probably as many as, as New York does, but the largest states don't require the higher level degrees. And the reason for that in my opinion, is that they need architects. Ah, <laughs> they need architects yeah. more, than, more than some of the smaller states do. You know, the uh, NCARB, <clears throat> the IDP program, first caught on in the southern states, the states where there are very few architects. Alabama, Mississippi, um, Texas, you know, some of the states that you wouldn't think have that many architects. Uh, and they didn't at the time. They, of course, do now. But... Um, they, they were the most restrictive states in terms of education, but the ones that are larger in general uh, are the least restrictive. But going back to Wisconsin, in the case of Wisconsin, you would uh, take the exam, pass it, ask Wisconsin to license you as an architect, and they will accept you because you don't, you don't need a master's degree. Then um, once you're licensed in Wisconsin, you can begin earning credits under what they call the Broadly Experienced Architect Program, and that's run by the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards, or NCARB, just like the, the IDP program is. So after five years of working, <clears throat> you can apply for licensure, or you can apply for what they call certification with NCARB, and certification allows you to practice in any state. Uh, so, so once you've achieved that certification, you can come back to Illinois and say you want to be licensed in Illinois, and they will grant it for you because you have the required document, the certification that NCARP will give you after five years of practice. Now, the, the key is you have to practice under, <clears throat> the way it's currently set up, is you have to practice under an architect who is licensed in Wisconsin. Now, that's going to change, Mike. I mean, yeah. it's, uh, in about a year or so, uh, NCARP is going to allow you to be practicing under any licensed architect not one licensed in, in Wisconsin. So you could do it from a different state? So Well, you can do it from a different state. There are many, many architects <coughs> in Illinois, for example, and Illinois is my state that I, that I live in and have the most experience with. There are many architects licensed in Illinois who are also licensed in Wisconsin. So if you're working for a large firm, uh, there's probably an architect in that firm that is yeah. licensed in Wisconsin. As long as you're working under their direction, you have to be working under their direction, then uh, for five years, doesn't matter whether you're a resident of Wisconsin or whether you're working in Wisconsin, uh, it has no relation to it. So the Broadly Experienced Architect Program is a very useful tool for the folks who are in that boat 
Right. Um, but it's probably a harder process to do than just doing, like if you're at the beginning of this process, just getting get the, the masters, education. get the right. education, I, I would recommend do the IDP, yeah. get take the exam, and, and then... The, the first all. path is the best way. Right. Um, but for those that just can't, as, as you were just saying, yeah. can't... This, either the money isn't right, or the situation isn't right, or you got two kids and you're working a or, job and you're trying or, to do I a mean, thing, or whatever. I, I've been called by people who are principals in large firms in Chicago that don't right. have master's degrees, and they say, "What do I do?" You know, I'm panicked. I, yeah. I have to be. They won't let me be a, a continue to be a partner unless I get licensed. Yeah, that's, I've actually. Well, had, that's the only way to do it. I've had a lot of people in my classes that way, and uh, yeah, it, uh, it's a it's an interesting thing. So this is one sort of useful way to do it. But I, the reason I throw that little line in there is, you know, be strategic about your planning in this process. Just because you can do it that way, I wouldn't necessarily assume that that's the smartest way for you to go. But for a lot of people, it's, it's going to be... It's what they call a workaround. It's a workaround. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that's great. I'm glad that it's there. It's right, exactly. But, yeah. but I should also mention that uh, the current CEO of NCARB, Mike Armstrong, is a very strong advocate of letting a thousand flowers bloom, as, as Jack Hartree used to say, my, my mentor. Um, <laughs> in other words... <clears throat> Allow as many people as you can to become licensed architects. <clears throat> Don't set the standard so high that it's an elite profession. It becomes an elite profession that keeps out people that can, can contribute tremendously to the uh, architectural profession, yeah. but would, would not normally be able to, uh, to go through the standardized process. Well, and as you say, like seven years of school can be very, very expensive, let it, you know, not earning income. So finding other ways to, to allow that to happen does make a lot of sense. Right. And it, it sounds like they've been very receptive to that, but it's still a bit of a slog. And Mike is leading the way, and his board is supporting him uh, in every step that he's taking. He is, he's planning on, uh, first of all, he was, the, he was the inspiration for reducing the IDP by virtually a year. Yeah. Instead of a three-year process, it's now a two-year process. He was the inspiration for that, along with his board, of course, that supported him. And he's also promoting uh, a new major change to the broadly experienced architect program, where you can earn those, uh, those additional years of experience while you're working, before you become licensed. <laughs> right. So you don't have to wait until after you're licensed during those additional years, which really will compress the whole process. And this is gonna happen if, if the member board support it. Everything has to be voted on by the 55 jurisdictions. And that, that occurs in, I believe it's June of every year when they have a big meeting. <clears throat> if the other 55 boards, the majority of the 55 boards support it, it's probably gonna happen by next summer. That shortcutting of, of the broadly experienced architect program. So the workaround to the workaround. Well, they're also going to eliminate the fee. It's a huge fee right now. It's $1,500, I think, yeah. to go through it. So it's, they're going to eliminate that totally. Yeah, there's a lot of fees involved. Yes, it's there a, is. You know, and people and complain know about that, that all the time. They're, they're trying to change that. But it's, it's also hard to do this stuff without, like, there's a lot of uh, overhead just keeping a thing like well, this rolling. Yeah. And yeah. so... I think, you know, from what I've talked to them about, like I was always very upset by how big the fees were. And then when I've talked to them, it kind of made more sense to me. And uh, so I, I think it's well, just Well, do you want to talk the about deal. the fees? Um, is that relevant to our discussion today? Yeah, I, I think anything is along the way as we're going, sure. Well, um, the IDP, I'm sure people listening would be very interested in the fees. The yeah, IDP definitely. fee is, is uh, affordable. It's, uh, I think, $350 still. Uh, and when you're in school, uh, you can pay $100 and then pay the rest of it after you graduate or pay the rest of it when you're ready to take the exam. Uh, and then there's a, after three years, they, they expect you to finish the IDP in three years, even though there's only two years worth of actual experience that's required now. But after three years, they, they tack on an additional $75 a year for keeping your records um, in, their, in their system. So then, let's say you, you pay the 350 and you're ready to go on to take the ARE. The ARE is a kind of a pay-as-you-go thing. It's $210 per division. There's seven and divisions. And there's seven divisions, so it's... Currently okay. seven divisions. Uh, so it's about $1,400. 1400 something. something like that, by the time yeah. you add it all up. Yeah. And uh, many large firms actually will pay, will reimburse you for that cost. I know when I took the exam, the firm I was working for paid for it. Because they, they want you to be licensed, of course. Yeah. They, 
you know, that nobody's keeping, I, I think this is the thing that most people who are working toward licensure misunderstand. Architects don't want to keep you out of the profession. They're trying to bring you in because it helps their firm to have more architects, licensed architects working yeah. for it. If, if you're a firm of 30 people and you uh, can say that you have you know, 15 licensed architects mm -hmm. on board, that's a very different it's a uh, marketing point thing for the firm. To, to, for right. the firm than if you have three or something. Sure. Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. One of the things you just mentioned, which I just will talk about briefly, uh, you mentioned that uh, the NCARB folks will hold on to your records for when you pay the, the yearly fee to hold on to the records. That may sound a little funny, like why would you bother doing that? But in fact, actually, if you later, let's say you get licensed in uh, Wisconsin and then you move to uh, Colorado, uh, there's all these sort of different ways that you can get reciprocity and uh, be able to get become licensed in the other state that you move to. Sure. Uh, and part of the way that that works is because they're holding on to your records right. and there's a right. way. Now, there's some complications in there. You should always check out the individual states and what kind of reciprocity they have because it's not all of well, the same every, across the board. But. Every state, Mike, uh, accepts the certification from NCARB. Okay. So, so the process is once you pass the registration exam and you become licensed in, in your state, then you apply to NCAR for certification and as long as you have a master's degree, they'll give you a certification. You can take that certification to whatever state you want to be licensed in and they will honor it. They don't require any, well, except for California. Uh, California is the only state that requires that additional test which relates to their state code but other states will just accept it as it is because they, they know that that's the highest level of achievement in, in terms of licensure. So just part of the reason that there's all these fees is to sort of help that process, to, to you sort of keep you in good stead with, with the NCARB folks so that yeah. certification process works, works well. So every year, are you certified, Mike? Uh, I have, I've done it. I can't or certifiable, remember. Yeah, certifiable. certifiable. <laughs> I'm definitely certifiable. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, you know, I've been certified since 1975, and I've never used it once. Yeah, of course. I, I had a. Uh, there's plenty of work here in Chicago, but I had a, um, a job one time down in uh, Georgia that I was working on, and my client said, uh, "Are you licensed in Georgia?" And I said, "No." <laughs> and uh, he said, "Well, can you get licensed?" And I said, "Yeah, I can get licensed in Georgia. I have a certification. And they'll accept it right away." So that was the end of that. I mean, that was. It was uh, okay with him. Yeah. Uh, I, we didn't actually do any architectural work. It was it was mostly consultation work. So, so it was perfectly right. acceptable. But, to but it sort of got you in the in the door for a project. So that's good. Right. No. Um, so before we jump off of the education thing, there's this one last little bit, which is sort of for, for foreign educated folks. Oh yes, yes, um, right. Any any thoughts about that? Um, it's the broadly experienced foreign architect program. It's called. So we have the broadly experienced architect program, which is. Um, which is something that if you are in a, an American citizen, you would apply for, or a graduate of, I shouldn't say American citizen, but a graduate of a uh, uh, university in the United States. But if you're a graduate of a university from some other country, you can become licensed in any of the states in the United States or any of the provinces, any of the territories, <coughs> any of the provinces in Canada, by going through the broadly experienced foreign architect program. Now that, it's similar to the broadly experienced architect program in the sense you have to work for an architect who is licensed in this country for a certain number of years. I think it's five years still. And you have to go through an interview process and you have to uh, have your degree made equivalent to an NAAB accredited degree. So you have to be able to show your transcripts, you have to right. be able to show portfolio work, uh, you have to like somebody is actually the, going through it, right. and then you yeah. do uh, an interview, and uh, yeah. it's, all it's the while expensive. you're also getting I, I experience. I think what, by the time you're done with this, it's probably going to cost you about $5,000 to yeah. go through this process. All the different bits yeah. and pieces if you add them all up. So here again, NCARB is trying to make it easier for people with foreign degrees to become licensed in this country. And so what they're proposing, which will probably go through next summer again, just like the uh, change to the broadly experienced architect program, they're proposing that foreign architects' degrees will be accepted, as they are, without having to go through the equivalency program process, and that they have to go through IDP and pass IDP, I mean, finish their IDP, and they have to go through the ARE. 
So just like any architect who is licensed in this country. And no portfolio anymore, no transcripts anymore, all that stuff is going to be gone. Wow. So this will be a really good, easy way for foreign architects to become licensed in this country. Well, that would be really we interesting need, to We see. need architects. Yeah. I, I have to emphasize this. We are short of architects right now. Uh, certainly that's a coming sad in, the, situation. in the future, that's what everybody's, uh, we're short in a certain way right now, but everybody's mostly right. worried about like five, ten years from now, I think, right? That's when the as, demographics as are. the principals in firms begin to retire, they need to be replaced by um, the younger members of the firm, and there's just not enough of them who are licensed. And so it's, it's going to be a, a tough time in the next few years to make that transition. Everybody says, you know, it's tough to make the transition with new technologies, but it's also tough to make the transition with filling those positions that are going to be opening up in the larger firms with licensed architects. Because there's a, a fair number of graduates, but there's yeah. not a lot of licensed architects. That's who have true, made the, and, made the and process. It's, uh, it's picking up though. And NCARB is saying, and they, they've been reporting that there is an increase in the number of um, interns that are going through the licensure process now. For a long time, there was a kind of a, um, a slowing down process or a stopping process even where architects were just saying it takes too long to become licensed. You know, we go through six or seven years of school and then we go on and we have to go through the internship and then we have to take the exam and the exam takes forever to finish because you take just one division a month, maybe at the fastest, maybe one division every six months. And so it, it takes literally years. I think they did some statistics on this, NCARB did. And it worked out to uh, uh, the average person who started in, in school from the time, I'm sorry, who finished school from the time they finished school to the time they were licensed was something like 20 years. It was amazing. Wow. And you know, it just, it, it, that, that explains why there, there are so few architects that are becoming licensed these days. It just but takes too it, long. It's definitely doable, and especially now that NCARB is more interested oh, in making now, it happen, it's much, it's the, it should be much faster. They, they've and, shortened the IDP program to two years from three. Yeah. And they made the exam easier. We should talk about the new exam that's coming we'll up. we'll talk and, about in a minute. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so all of these things are taking some time, but uh, there's a way to kind of make it uh, roll forward. And hey guys, uh, if you guys, if anyone has any questions, please pose them in the question box here, um, and I'll kind of try to cue them up to to the guys here as we're uh, as we're uh, discussing these different topics. All right. So uh, we've already mentioned it a little bit, but I think it's time to move on to the idea of experience, the IDP. Mm -hmm. um, so there's been for a long time uh, the intern development program IDP. Uh, and it's gone through a couple of changes we've started to mention. Um, uh, and I'm gonna put up here the um, list. It's, it's, you don't really need to go through it too, too closely because it's just sort of, for now, we're just gonna sort of talk about it conceptually. Um, but you can see there's this uh, list of uh, different areas where you, uh, you need to get uh, work done. So this is in pre-design here, then there's a design area, and then project management, and then practice management, uh, and then there's hours for each of these, uh, and then eventually a sort of total number down at the bottom. Uh, and this is that thing where, as a, an intern architect, you're working for a licensed architect directly underneath the licensed architect, and uh, from that, you, uh, that, that licensed architect is signing off on the hours that you've done, uh, and uh, it's sort of a way of making sure that you're getting a reasonably wide experience level. Yes, that's true. When, when I did my quote apprenticeship, <clears throat> there was none of these, this curriculum as it's called, that NCARB has, has um, created. And so you could be working in a firm doing the same thing over and over and over again. I, you know, I knew people that were kind of stuck in the design area <clears throat> forever because they were pretty good designers, but they never got experience in doing anything else. And so by the time they finished their apprenticeship and ready to take the exam, they were not very well experienced in the things that the exam concentrates on, which is a lot of practical kind of right. um, knowledge. <clears throat> and so they, they typically had a hard time passing the exam in that situation. So NCAR realized that, and that's when they created this, this curriculum for interns that, that's more broadly based. Now there is a tremendous amount of time that is scheduled in here for what they call construction documents. That's roughly about 
a third of the total. And, uh, and that's where most of the work in, in an architectural office takes place in creating the construction documents for permitting and bidding and construction. Um, it's probably not the most glamorous area of practice. And it's something that, that many architects try to avoid if they can because they'd <laughs> rather do the fun stuff. Uh, there's also uh, a lot of time involved here in, in what they call um, practice management, uh, business operation, business operations, and um, uh, uh, construction yeah. administration. And, and that kind of, well, the practice management in includes leadership and service, which is basically volunteer work, uh, not necessarily done within the, in fact, it's not, not allowed to be done within the office. It has to be done outside of the office. But we can talk about that later. But there, there are areas that many times, especially in large firms, you are not allowed to get experience in. The, the business operations, managing the firm itself, is something that you almost have to get experience by observation rather than by participation. Because as an intern, you probably aren't going to be given the responsibility to schedule your peers you know, with, with um, work that is assigned to them. But you will certainly observe how your boss is going to be scheduling those people. And that's the kind of way that they allow you to have that experience. Right. You know, uh, people, I remember when IDP was first being mandated and people were kind of upset. That, oh, is one more bureaucratic hurdle that we have to go through right. and all of that. Uh, but as you say, the, the big advantage of IDP is that it actually gives the interns <laughs> a way to talk to their employers and to say, oh, you know, like I really need to have experience on the job site, or I need to have experience sitting in on a client meeting, or because I have to get my IDP. And so, while it is a bureaucratic hurdle that you have to get through, it's also a really useful tool for making sure you're getting a wide range of experiences. Yes, because once you're licensed, you can go off on your own, start your own firm, and you need to have that kind of knowledge. Yeah, I remember there was one case. Um, I do a lot of lectures at, at universities to uh, students that are about ready to graduate, usually. And one student came up to me after the session, this was at a uh, local college here in, in Illinois. Uh, a student came up to me afterwards and he said that he was gonna start a firm as soon as he graduated. And I said, oh, how are you gonna do that? And he says, well, I'm gonna hire an architect to be my <laughs> architect and I'm, I'm awesome. gonna run the firm. Apparently he had connections, you know, <laughs> some kind of, and I said, well, you won't be able to get any IDP experience that way because you have to be working for the firm to get the, the internship experience. But uh, he was crestfallen because this was his goal. This was his yeah, idea. I, I love it. I think that's great, actually. <laughs> yeah. Guys, I have a, a question here from, from John. He's asking, how can somebody gain better experience in the, areas, in the areas that are not necessarily part of the services typically offered by, you know, traditional firms. Um, he says, you guys mentioned the Emerging Professionals Companion, uh, which he th you know, suggests he thinks is being uh, phased out in the next year or so. Any other thoughts on this? Mike, you want to? No, go ahead. I mean, it, okay. it is, in fact, being phased out. I, it, there's some other things coming in to replace it. But um, did, any thoughts on that? Well, uh, the, the whole, this whole area of what they call supplemental experience, <clears throat> the S category in, in NCARB's three categories of experience, the A stands for working for an architect, O stands for working for somebody other than an architect, which you can get experience for, and, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then the S stands for things that you might do on your own, such as the Emerging Professionals Companion, what, um, which, which are these case studies that I was saying that you can, that you can read and answer the questions and get experience. And that is, <clears throat> that is being phased out and will no longer be available for uh, experience, for applicable experience. So in those areas that are difficult to get experience in, such as what I just mentioned, the business operations and spec writing, you know, you have to spend a certain, certain amount of time here in learning how to write specifications, uh, cost estimating, and even construction observation. There are some firms, I remember there was one big firm here in, in Chicago a few years ago when there was virtually no work being done in this country. All of their work was overseas. And they came to me and they said, how do we get experience? Right. In, how, do, how do our interns get experience in construction observation when we don't have any 
local right when everything is happening in and, Dubai and we can't, or China and we can't or send them over to these other places where the construction is going on. So NCARB did respond to that, and their response was, "You can go to a construction site with your mentor." Now, we haven't talked about mentors yet, but we should. Yeah. You can go to a construction site with your mentor and get experience, and your mentor probably is somebody, should be somebody outside of your firm who will be kind of like a coach, kind of help you through this, this whole process. And there are a lot of architects out there that serve that role as mentors. And you can go to a construction site with them. You don't have to go necessarily in your own firm and still get that experience that you need. So that's the way to do it that way. And, and these other areas, the spec writing and the, and the um, organization of work within the firm, construction administration work, those kind of things, if your firm doesn't provide it, then you need to get experience somewhere else. And, and I frankly tell, tell my interns that, that ask me this question, if your firm doesn't provide these services, you do need to get experience in them. So you're going to have to go to another firm at some point. And that's nothing, no mark against you at all to do yeah. that. In fact, it's good to get a wide range of experience in a lot of firms. Yeah, I mean, the great thing that I always say is, you know, even if you come out of school and you're, you need to make some money and you get a job at a place that isn't the perfect spot for you, but, you know, at least it kind of gets you going, there's going to be great experience to be had there. You know, there's going to be somebody there who really knows how to detail a building or somebody who's really good at contracts or something. And you just want to be sort of strategic about it. Like, you scope out the situation, see what's, what's interesting that's happening there, and then get as much experience at that as you can, as well as whatever you can get on your IDP, and then move on when the moment's right. Yeah, keep in mind that you are not required <clears throat> to do any of this on your own. You're not required to do cost estimating on your own. You're required to work under the direction of somebody. That's the whole idea behind the internship program, is that you have a guide, you have a, a supervisor who will um, help you through this process. They won't give you full responsibility for it. Uh, I do remember uh, when I was an apprentice, um, my, my boss took me into his office one day and he said, here's, here's the budget we have for this job. And we have so much money allocated to design, so much money allocated to design development, so much for construction documents and so much for construction administration. He had the numbers actually blacked out, so I couldn't see it. But he, but he told me this is how you organize the job and you have to make sure that you're not exceeding the number of person hours, man hours, for each one of those categories, otherwise your firm is not gonna make any money. Right, time is money. And, yeah. and that's the kind of, of sit down discussion that you need to have at some point during your, because they don't teach you this in school. <laughs> And, and if they do teach you in school, it just goes over your head and you yeah, forget about it's, it. It's too... It's too you you uh, learn enough to pass the test. Right, exactly. That's all. <laughs> uh, but those are really important conversations to have. Yeah. And partly it's about IDP and partly it's just about making yourself a more well-rounded architect as you move through the process. And maybe now is a good time to talk about this mentorship yeah. relationship. Um, NCAR from, the very, from its very beginnings said that there are two people involved in your becoming an architect, beside yourself. One is your supervisor, and that's the person who is your boss, which I call the boss, the person who observes you on a, on a daily basis, gives you assignments to do, reviews the assignment, and is pays, also licensed. pays your, pays your uh, salary. And, and who, would, who would be a licensed architect? The second person is a mentor. And the mentor should be a licensed architect, although they don't have to be in the same firm. They, they, I'm sorry, they do have to be a licensed architect, but not necessarily in the same state that you're in. Um, and you meet with them, I always recommend on a monthly basis, you sit down, you tell them what you're doing, they give you feedback on how they think you're doing and what, what you need to do in order to become uh, more skilled at the direction that you're trying to go in. It's a, it's a way of unloading your problems because there's always problems that people have in every firm where they, you know, they, they don't like somebody or somebody's criti highly critical of their work and, and it just, they just get aggravated by it. And so they have to have somebody to share this with. You can't share it with your boss. Right. You know that. And, and so it gives you another way of, of uh, 
uh, inspecting how you, you, yourself and how you're making progress and how you can better yourself in the profession. Uh, okay. It's something that's recommended, always has been recommended, I always recommend it to interns that contact me, but it's not absolutely required. And you know, there are some states that have toyed with the idea of requiring mentors, but none of them have actually come through. Yeah, it's a tricky thing to require, I think, but, um, but it is a really good idea. Uh, for one, it turns all those, uh, as you say, those kind of negative conversations into constructive converse conversations. Sure. Instead of just sort of gossiping about how you hate your firm, <laughs> you now you have a chance to actually talk about, well, why is it working? Why is it not or working? Or how you're not how making as it, much money as you think you yeah, should as be. As you think you should, and, right? And, and they'll give you a better perspective. <laughs> Somebody could give you a little bit of a, a way to see it from a different angle. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Um, and one of the things I've always found, whether it's an official version of mentoring or not, but uh, architects are across the board really happy to talk to young architects, mm -hmm. recent, recent graduates, people who are students. Uh, because they remembered what it was like when they went through. Yeah, and it's kind of a bond. They want to share the that. studio process. Sure. We're, we're kind of all bonded in this exactly. kind of interesting way. Uh, that, that definitely go out of your way to make those contacts, even if it's not through a, a classic program. And that brings up a very important part of your profession, and that is joining the AIA, the American Institute of Architects. Uh, as an intern, before your license, uh, our local chapter here in Chicago has a program where you can get free membership for a year after you graduate from college. And Take advantage of that. And, all and it's not of, very much money even, even yeah. after that year is up. It's, it's still not very much money to, to continue your membership. But the advantage of being a member of the AIA is that you get to meet a lot of people. Yes, yeah, networking. There's a lot of opportunities. Uh, often they have study guides for the ARE. Often, like sure. there's all sorts of things. There, uh, virtually, every, there's something going on here in Chicago every night. Lectures. That you can there's all kinds of different things happening. Yeah. That kind of ties in nicely here to a, a question that Travis just asked. Is there a resource online where he can go to find a mentor uh, uh, in his area? I mean, I think actually what you just said, uh, you know, maybe joining your local AIA chapter is sure. a good place to start. I don't know if there are any online resources. Um, uh, no, there know, aren't. Uh, you know, um, some, some states I've <clears throat> heard by attending our uh, advisor conference uh, on a yearly basis, some states have tried to implement this program where they get people to sign up for mentors and they place them with, with interns. Uh, we don't do that here in Illinois. Uh, I've, I made an attempt to do that. I had a meeting with potential mentors a few years ago at the AIA and we had about 10 people show up for that and they all pledged that they would be mentors. So I had a list of people that I could assign. The problem is, I find, not so much that there's a shortage of mentors, but there is a lack of interest in, or not interest so much as, as a lack of courage on interns' parts to approach a mentor. To make it happen. And, yeah. and because they have to make some kind of move in that direction. Mentors aren't going to come to you. Right. You're going to have to go to the mentor. Yeah, but a good, I think a good way to start is to go to your local uh, AAA chapter. There's, there's going to be somebody there who this is a big deal to, um, and they'll be able to get you connected to local folks. Um, and any, any way that you can do any sort of networking is like, you'll, you can find mentors along the way as well, just by being sort of open to it uh, when you're talking to people at different firms, when you go to lectures, and like there's ways to kind of make it happen even outside of the realm of the AIA, but that's certainly a good place to start. Or if you have a professor in college that you're particularly, um, like that professor, perhaps, you can ask them to also serve as your mentor. That would be another opportunity. Yeah, and they also often will have a fairly large network of people themselves, and they'll know kind of who you are and who the other uh, people in their circle are, are. So there's a lot of connections get made. That actually happens. I do that all the time with folks, actually. Mm -hmm. cause I, uh, Mike, my did, you ever, did you ever meet Robert Rosenfeld from NCARB? Uh, I did, yes. Uh, Rob was the uh, legendary uh, head of the IDP. He was the first head of IDP. A lot of what IDP is today is the result of Rob's uh, hard work in this area. And Rob used to talk about his mentorship program that he ran. And what he would do is he would go to the universities, this is in Washington DC area, so he'd go to the local universities and interview for mentees. 
Right. So he would have people come to his office. He'd set up an office somewhere at the school. He'd have people come in, and he would ask them what they were you know, interested in, whether they wanted to be a, a mentee of his. And he would pick 12 out of that group, and they would meet on a monthly basis. They would go various places. They would have potluck dinners at his house or somebody else's house. And it sounded like a great and program. They'd also go look at like some buildings and things yeah. as well. They do right. like field right. trips and things. Field trips and, yeah. and I wish that there was a way of institutionalizing that. He had that program and he was trying to encourage other people yeah. to start a program just like it. Well, you know, one of the things I, I throw out to the people listening is, you know, set it up. Uh, right. Go to your local AIA, say, hey, I heard about this great idea. I think we should make that happen. Become the go-to person for it and That'll get you networked all over the place. People will be very impressed if you can do that. At Triton happen. College, we had a program called <clears throat> Dinner with an Architect that was once a month. <laughs> and the architects who were um, in the Triton College district would volunteer to, at their own home, have our students come and, and talk to them. Yeah. And, and they would have dinner. It sounded like a great program. I never attended one of those, but I heard from the students that they thought it was just wonderful. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> You could do that, Mike. I could do. I actually have done similar <laughs> things, not quite uh -huh. under that name, uh, but I've had many, many students over in my house, um, which is a, a wreck right now because we're about to go under construction. But uh, there oh. you go. So, uh, so just uh, regarding the IDP, so we we looked at one example here on the screen that uh, has a bunch of hours associated with it, but it is actually going through um, a uh, little bit of a change. So some, it's still essentially the same. Uh, kind of concept, but they're kind of grouping it a little bit differently. I believe that's going to be as of probably yeah, after that June meeting that you were talking the, about. These six groups that you see are practice management, project management, programming and analysis, project planning and design, project development and documentation, construction and evaluation. Those six groups of experience are exactly the same six groups that the exam, will, the new exam will be based on. Right, so they're kind of streamlining the process right. to make things more connected from one. So you're going from 17 experience areas down to six, you're going from seven divisions of the exam down to six, and that's gonna happen next year. Yeah. It's not very long from now when this will take place. Now if you're already in the program, if you're progressing, taking the test, there's probably no reason why you need to switch over but if you haven't started the test yet, <clears throat> what I would recommend... So I'm going to jump ahead here on the oh, slide. Oh, okay. You're going to talk to the, about the test. Get, okay. Let's just jump into the exam. Because we don't have much time left. Yeah, so we're doing okay. We so uh, so this, this slide is getting at what Frank was just talking about. Uh, if you uh, look on the sort of list down the side here, this is the current exam and the seven different topics. So there's construction documents and services, programming planning and practice, site planning and design, building design and construction systems, structural systems, building systems, and schematic design. And you'll notice that each of these, kind of if you think of the easiest one to think about it is probably structural and systems, um, that these are essentially set up as silos. That these are, so this exam is all about all the contracts, and this exam is all about all the structural issues, and this exam is all about all the systems issues. Um, and that's sort of not how architecture works is you know that architecture really works that we're either in the early phases of a project and we're worried about all the things that happened in the early days or we're in the end phases and it's during construction or we're in the design phases and so all of those things are all mixed together and so the folks at NCARB have come up with a uh, new ARE 5.0 the current one is 4.0 um, and the 5.0 is set up on this idea, on those same names that Frank was just talking about. So it's uh, practice and management, uh, pro project management, programming and analysis, uh, project planning and design, uh, uh, project development and documentation. So uh, kind of construction document sets essentially. Uh, and then- And specifications. And specifications, yeah. And then uh, construction and evaluation. So evaluation sort of referring to uh, kind of post-occupancy evaluations and uh, that kind of thing. And construction referring to kind of CA, construction administration type work. So clearly there'll be structural issues happening in many of those. There'll be systems issues happening in many. There'll be contract issues. So it's just sort of a different way of approaching the same set of information. It's a different way of grouping those things together. Sure. I think it's much better than, than the current way. <clears throat> so it'll be an improvement. But if you haven't yet started taking the 4.0, because 5.0 is coming up pretty quickly, 
what NCARB is recommending if you wanted to streamline your whole test process is to take three of the tests under the 4.0, which will continue to exist until 2018, middle, mid of 2018. Take three of them under 4.0, if you're ready to take the test right away. And those three are the first three on the list here. Once you've completed those, you only have two more in 5.0 to take. So you get credit for all the 5.0 that those will um, encompass. As you can see, Mike is drawing a big circle around them. Uh, and then you only have two more left. So in a sense, you can cheat it. <laughs> They're recommending this. You can cheat the process by only taking five exams instead of six. So the little or dots, instead of seven under the current right exactly the little rule. dots are talking about sort of uh, content areas and you see if you if you take away those first three under 4.0 then what's left is uh, just these two uh, exams under 5.0 and they will let you do that you can yeah. take not uh, only that they encourage you to do that right because so. well partly because they they don't want people to say oh there's a new exam coming we'll wait and suddenly it's you get this big two year gap and people get out of the practice of now, I have to say, if you've already finished some of the others, some of the specialty divisions in here, structural or building systems, that's fine. And you can continue to take 4.0 until uh, it's phased out, which is 2018, 2018. So you have, you have plenty of time to finish it. Yeah. And there's no reason to, I mean, I, I think what, you, what you're suggesting is just be strategic about it. Take right. those first three ones first. Sure. So you can, like, if you need to switch over, you can switch over to 5.0 at that point. Yeah. You're probably not going to save any money. Yeah. Uh, they haven't said how much the new test is going to be, but my guess is it's probably going to be just the same as the existing one. Yeah, they're, they're not similar, reducing the price. Yeah, um, uh, but you will save time. That's the big advantage. Yeah. So right now, my suggestion is just take the exam. <laughs> just yeah, go and jump take in. the exams. Jump in. Um, one of the things people get very nervous about it. Like, okay, so this is the mandatory. Uh, the old guys in the room have to say this, um, that, uh, you know, when we took the when exam. When we took the exam. Uh, you know, it was four straight days. It was an ordeal. And it, you took it, it was, you know, once a year it would be offered, it would take it, and it was four straight days. It, it's essentially the same content. Uh, I mean, obviously things now, have changed could, a little bit, but not that much. And Yeah, you uh, could probably take an exam a day if you wanted to. We have actually have a, a good friend who's done that. Yeah. We were talking on one of our last webinars uh, with, with him about who, who did that, and he talks very, he has a blog about it and everything. And that's totally doable. Oh, but, he's but the given, uh, president uh, of the IES? Former, yeah. yeah former yeah. president. Yeah. Um, uh, but even given that, um, even if you kind of doing it more in the kind of current style, there's some big advantages of being able to do like schedule when you want and to take one at a time. And it's worth, you know, using those big advantages. But there's really no reason why you should take longer than, a, say, a month between right. uh, exams. And even if, yeah, even if I you recommend do, a month, an exam a month. Even if you do it, it as, about right. like, say, you do three, and then you take a couple months off, and then you do three, and then you know, some, even if it's yeah. something like that, you should be able to do this easily in a year, and you've got sure. plenty of time. You've to got get five years to pass all the divisions. All the divisions. There is a rolling clock, which is the five-year um, thing, which uh, they what the NCAR doesn't want you to do is they don't want you to take one or two exams and then eight Sit or ten years for, later yeah. and then come back and take the rest of the things exams. will have changed because the exam bit. will have changed and it gets complicated and it, so there's, there's the whole profession why they, will have changed they want you to be focused on uh, kind of the current like mode you get through you become licensed and then after you become licensed then you have to think about continuing ed and it allows them to kind of keep everybody on the same uh, keel um, so you do have to if you're going to commit to it you got to Jump in it. Well, it's a it's a lifelong learning process too. We should yeah. say this is not when you're done with the ARE, you're not done. I mean, you still are going to be going through continuing education for the rest of your career, and that's good. Yeah, it keeps you on your toes, keeps everybody on their toes, and advances the profession, which is what we want to do. Guys, can you talk a little bit about the um, the timing of this? Because we've talked that ARE 4.0 is the current exam, and then ARE 5. Is of course the next exam, but just to be clear about the timing. Sure, absolutely. So how they overlap. right now we're uh, in the kind of end of 2015. Uh, ARE 4.0 has been going for a number of years. Um, uh, there was 3.1 before that. There was 3.0. Uh, it was you know, the original ones, um, but uh, right now we're the only one offered is 4.0. So if you're going to start the exam right now, you're going to be taking 4.0. And 4.0 will be offered all the way until June 
of 2018. Uh, 5.0 is going to uh, start being offered in mid-2016. Now, amazingly to me, mid-2016, it turns out, is actually relatively soon. Yes, it is. Um, this is one of those surprising things. Time marches on. Um, and when they first started announcing it, it seemed like it was years away. Uh, but in fact, it's uh, around you know, the this corner. This is a testimony to Michael uh, Armstrong's great leadership of NCARB to get these things moving quickly. Years ago, before he came on board, he's not an architect, by the way. He's the first, the first uh, executive director of NCARB that's not an architect. He's a business person. So he's been able to push things through relatively quickly. And I like that about him. So uh, I was actually pointing at the wrong one here. Actually, it's really it's pointing at uh, late, uh, late 2016. 2016. Yeah. So it'll be, you know, presumably that means November or something of 2016. 5.0 I think it means December. Start. Does it mean December? Yeah, because there, there's an 18-month period in there where they're going to continue 4.0. So you take 18 months from... Oh, you subtract from June. From, sure. Yeah, to June 30th. Um, so uh, yeah. 5.0 will be available uh, at the end of 2016. Um, and then they'll be both available from December of 2016 until June, that 18 month period that Frank was just talking about. Uh, and you can take either. Um, you have to be in one or the other. Um, so either you're doing 4.0. Uh, yeah, so you have to declare that you want to upgrade. Right. Um, so you have a couple of choices. Uh, right now, you, you could start in 4.0 and do the seven exams that way, which Frankly, is what I would suggest. I think it's. I would too. I, you know, it's the the devil. You know, um, there's a lot of study yeah. materials out there. There's a lot of people who have taken it this way. You have a lot of mentors who who can help you through the process. Uh, anytime there's a changeover, it's always a little bit of a confusion. The, the, the and new going the on. new test is kind of interesting. You want me to talk about sure. it a little bit? Yeah. Um, historically, the profession has always judged the ability of an architect by their skill in drawing. And, uh, you know, you think of an architect as being somebody who draws most of the time. And, but this new test will have no drawing in it whatsoever. Right, the vignettes are the gone. Vignettes yeah. are all gone. Thank God, in a yeah. way, you know. The vignettes, I mean, those... vignettes are, it's time for them to go. <laughs> yes. yeah. um, but what they will have instead is what they call hot spots on, on the test, where you identify areas, you identify parts of a building plan that they will show you uh, as having a... Um, a certain feature to it, and and so that that way they can judge your your knowledge. Number one, they can judge your your ability to analyze a situation. So this has a lot of input from professional educators and test writers who work on these things as their career. You know, to try to figure out whether people are are knowledgeable enough to become an architect. So yeah. I'm assuming that this is going to be a, a, an improvement. To yeah, the, to well, the former one test. of the other examples that uh, when I was talking with folks at NCARB about it, um, the example that they gave was the idea of a, uh, like a case study, I think is how they referred mm -hmm. to it, where you might get uh, a bit of a drawing, a bit of a specification, a bit of code information, maybe something, maybe a program information, and then there might be four or five. Or I actually think it would be fun. Seven to questions take these about tests. that. Yeah. Um, I would like to take this. Test. <laughs> well, 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 I. <laughs> I say, let's make Frank take yeah. the um, so the Every I mean, five years, I need the to take good, <laughs> The good news is that I think it does actually make sense that it is fitting in more to the way that the profession is done. Um, it makes, it's, it's sort of a, a more logical process for thinking about how these things go. The idea of case studies, instead of these like one single piece of question that's kind of out of the blue and then another one and then another one, it's sort of more kind of things sort of make more sense architecturally. The flip side of that, though, is um, you know when you really get down to studying for something, like studying for structures, for example, it's kind of handy just to spend a couple weeks studying for structures and then take the structures exam. So in a certain way, it may be actually easier to take the current exam than the coming exam. But who knows, right? Um, I say get it done, just you know blast through it. There's no big reason to, to wait for the 5.0. Uh, but uh, being strategic, think about what makes sense to you. Think about the fact of the take the three first and 4.0, and then you can do the other two and 5.0, uh, or at least just take one to see how you feel about it, and you know learn from the process. Guys, I have guys, I have a question here. 
Um, we skipped over some of the content about the uh, about the logging your hours in those six categories. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about um, just the process of recording your IDP hours and, sure. and advocating for yourself in order to make sure that you um, you know are getting the appropriate hours in the different categories? So this is back to IDP yeah. and. Um, one thing I will say before, Frank, you I'm sure have a lot to say about this, but uh, uh, back a few years ago, they made a rule change. It used to be that you had you could you could log your hours pretty much any time. Like people were doing it five, six years after they had done the the work, and it was kind of horrible. Uh, speaking yeah. as a licensed architect who had a lot of people under uh, coming to architects are notorious procrastinators. procrastinators. <laughs> and you know, you'd get I'd get They're somebody the and they'd they'd say they'd come up and they'd they'd uh, you know send me an email saying so, you know hi Mike this is Beth I worked with you seven years ago can you sign you know and like oh my God I can't I can't even remember who Beth is you know um, and uh, you know you're, you're trying to figure out what yeah. they worked on it was a disaster um, and they thankfully though it's made life a little complicated for some folks, but they thankfully made it um, so that now you have to essentially keep up to date. With, yeah, with well, unfortunately, a lot, a lot of uh, longtime interns, at, at which there are many of, uh, find themselves with their pants down on this because they didn't realize this was happening. And all of a sudden, it snuck up on them, and, and now they can't record the time that they always intended to record, right. but never got around to doing it. So here again, NCARB has softened their approach to this a little bit. It used to be six months for well, quite, a while, quite a while now, yeah. a few years now. It used to be six months. It had to be contemporaneous reporting of your time, experience. Uh, and then they give you a two-month grace period, so it's really eight months. So an experience you had eight months ago, you can record now. That's, that's the rule. But what they have changed, which is an effect, um, is that they will give you half credit for the time before that eight months. So if you had credit back to five years. So if you had some time five years ago, uh, you could come to Mike and say, remember Mike when I worked for you five years ago? <laughs> hey Beth. Yeah. Um, and I just want half the time that I spent. And, right. and that, that you will, as long as your supervisor will agree to that and sign off on it, because they, they remember you, um, and they haven't moved then on you will get that credit for half the time. So it's not totally lost. Yeah. But it is totally lost beyond the five years. Yeah. And I, I think that's a, a reasonable kind of be it mix is, between it the is. two. Five it seems. years seems like a long time. But there, yeah. I know that from my experience in talking to interns, many of them just postpone longer than five years. Yeah, and you it just know, for They don't record reason. at all. They yeah. never signed up for IDP. They didn't know IDP existed. So <laughs> the gist of the situation is that you have uh, an IDP account uh, on the NCARB site and that your supervisor uh, has uh, an account also and that you essentially submit your, you, you go on, there's like a little form you fill out. Well, the supervisor out. doesn't have to have an account. What they do is uh, NCARB will email your supervisor okay. with a uh, request for um, verification of the time that you spent. So you do it all online. You, you go into your account, record the hours online. That information gets emailed to your supervisor, and the supervisor will email back. <coughs> I had one situation where... Um, a supervisor didn't have email a couple <laughs> years ago. There's no way to get in touch with him through email. So, so uh, NCARB kindly allowed um, that person to fax in the information. Pony Express, something? Yeah, yeah. Pony Express, right. Yeah. I mean, it, was, it was kind of a strange thing. You'd think everybody has email these days, yeah. but some of these old, old time guys still don't have it. Uh, so, so the the trick here is you just start your in, uh, NCARB IDP account uh, there's a whole sort of process to doing that. It's fairly, <laughs> fairly simple and straightforward. Uh, and then once you've got work going, you establish who your supervisor is. Um, it's, it can be a couple different people, but um, generally sure. people do it with one person, I think. I, I don't know if that's true. Is that reasonable? To no, you can do it as, as many people as you want uh, who supervise your work. So you, you record the work. And then you list the person who is your supervisor. And keep in mind that the supervisor has to be licensed. Although they, they've softened up a little bit on that licensure. It used to be that they had to be licensed in the same state right, and which now, you're working. Now it's, it could be any state. Which is handy given the way that people offices sure. work now because right. there's so many people they, working across state lines. Mm -hmm. Makes uh, sense. And so once you've set up that account, then you just sort of find a regular rhythm. Um, they're not going to make it happen. You have to make it happen. So yeah. you. 
uh, you know, I think the six month thing, even if it's not a total requirement, I, I would still use that, uh, you know, find maybe it's your birthday and your half birthday or something, you know, or uh, the, you know, sometime in June and then sometime in, in December is find a way that you sort of always go through, get yeah, the I stuff would, logged in if, and make it happen. If I were recommending to somebody, I would say do it every month. Yeah, actually month that is way probably you smarter. remember what you've done. It's really it's, is a long time. it's surprisingly hard to remember. Uh, you know, if you've worked on three or four different projects, man, it gets complicated. Uh, what happened, you know, five months ago on project number three? Uh, so yeah, monthly certainly makes sense. And you know, find some system that works for you. Maybe you do it on the first of every month, or maybe you do it, you know, whatever it is. But you find a system, uh, then you fill it out, uh, you submit it, and Carb will automatically, as Frank said, send it to the supervisor in that case. Uh, they then have a certain period of time to respond, um, which is pretty generous. I have to say that I have had, yeah, it's very generous. Uh, they, they, they don't have to respond right away. So your six-month period is from when you file it, not from when they right. sign. I think that's important. Which, speaking as somebody who signs <laughs> these things, I'm happy about that. Yeah. And, and I've had um, interns call me and say, my supervisor won't sign it because I got fired, so he won't sign it anymore. And I've had several people call me about that. And I said, well, it's their obligation to. They, they yeah. have no choice. They can't decide. Yeah, if you've done the work and you've done it successfully right. and all and, of that. And then. how do you enforce that? Well, <clears throat> in my case, I tell them to have them call me and I'll talk to them about right. their requirements to do that. Um, if that doesn't get the action, if they don't call me, I said the only way to do it is to, is to file a labor complaint against them. You know, and yeah. that, does, that gets them moving. Yeah, I mean, and that will definitely get them moving. I would absolutely start with... Uh, this doesn't happen very often, yeah. I have to say. You know? talk, so talk to the folks worry at about AIA <laughs> or something like that, and somebody will be, uh, like Frank, who will be in a sort of position of authority and can throw some gravitas Yeah, I should it. mention that the advisors, and there, there are several in Illinois, I'm the, I'm the state advisor, but there are also... <coughs> associate advisors who work for firms, and so you can go to them. Or there are educational advisors who are uh, teachers, and you can go to them as well. Yeah. And we've got about six advisors, I think, in Illinois. Or really just anybody who's sort of reasonable and got some, <laughs> has got some mojo, got some gravitas that can uh, right. have a reasonable conversation with somebody. I think your first step would be, your, if you're in school, to go to the yeah. education advisor. But that is a rare situation. So yeah, it is. It's very rare, bad. but it does happen, I have yeah. to say. <laughs> so. Keep in good, this is the lesson here, keep in, in good relationships with your firms. Yes. Don't burn any bridges. Don't burn you. bridges. That's actually great <laughs> advice. People don't understand how good advice that is. That is a huge deal. Uh, if you can go back and talk, you know, use the, the work from that project sure. uh, for your portfolio, if you can use them as a networking process, like, life will always be better if you can make that uh, be a positive experience. So um, we have a couple questions here I want to um, pose to you guys before we close, but just kind of as an overview, sort of a summary. So if I'm a, let's say I'm a, I want to become an architect and I want to sort of understand where to start. The first thing is I need to make sure that I'm a, um, in an NAAB accredited program and I've kind of defined kind of the road that I want to go on. And then once you've completed that, that's probably when you want to establish your, uh, your NCARB record which is oh, essentially I would do it at, while you're in school. So you could actually even do it while in school, but certainly by graduation you should yep. do it. So, and you're right. You mentioned that you get the discount. Uh, you only have to pay a little bit when you when you're in school. So you create your your NCARB record, which allows you to begin to um, document your IDP hours. Um, and so then you, of course, you want to do document your IDP hours. But now you can take the ARE um, upon graduation. So you can choose to wait. Um, and interestingly, NCARB's um, by the numbers report uh, 2015 showed that folks who waited until they were almost done or done with IDP actually had higher pass rates, yeah. 80, 81 percent versus folks who were five years before. Um, yeah, prior, actually, 81 percent is a very good number. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what is it? If, if it was 52. 52 if, if you were five years away from finishing IDP, it was 52 yeah. percent pass rate. Uh, if you were at ID, uh, the completion of IDP, right. it was 81. So, but in any case, uh, you can choose when you want to start taking in the ARE. So you can do that after you're done with IDP or overlap it as early as when you graduate. And so if you're in that sort of category right now, you need to sort of decide, hey, am I going to focus on ARE 4, which is going to be around right. until June of 2018 and just forget about ARE 5? Um, or am I going to kind of use this strategy here where we overlap the two of them 
Um, ARE 5 starts in uh, probably uh, December, December of 2016. So, you know, you can kind of focus on your overlap, maybe occurs around then. We'll have a new president by then. Right? We'll have a new president. We'll a new president. <laughs> <laughs> um, or you could sort of say, listen, I'm not going to take the ARE at all until ARE 5 is in town. And so I'm going to wait till December of 2016. And just focus and on, just focus on that. And all of that. And then, and then if I, for just, to, just to sort of finish the whole thing, if you then, once you then complete your, uh, you know, your exams, you've passed all seven of the ARE 4 exams or you've passed all six of the ARE 5 exams or five of the blended model there, um, then you, uh, you need, if you've overlapped this with IDP, you actually need to wait until you're done with IDP. So you right. need to complete these two things, IDP and the ARE. And then once you've completed those two things, you submit uh, through NCARB, you submit your certificate or you submit your record well, to, no, one, to your licensing step, board, right? One other step before that. Mm -hmm. You have to be licensed in one of the states. Just because you passed, you passed the ARE and you completed IDP doesn't mean you're automatically licensed. You have to apply to the state that you want to be licensed in as your first licensure state. <clears throat> and they will license you, but it's a process. You have to go through it and you have to pay a fee. In Illinois, it's $100. But they do require that application. And every Remember it, when you did that, get it. Didn't yeah. And just like with it. just like with the requirements of IDP and and the ARE, every state could theoretically be slightly different. So actually, one yeah. step that I missed in this well, whole certainly process. The, certainly, yeah. the application process is different in every state. Yeah. So yeah. one step that I missed at the beginning is that you need to you know have an idea of where you want to get licensed, and you need to get in touch with your state's licensing advisor. Um, in this case, of course, we're talking to Frank, who's um, the state licensing advisor for Illinois. But but yeah. also, you could talk directly to the licensing board. They'll have information. Every state will have their own. They'll have a website or some way yep. of, of transmitting information. And absolutely, you want to make sure. Like like I said in the very beginning, most people are going to sail right through this without any problem. Uh, you're going to go to an accredited school. It's going to be fairly straightforward. You're going to start doing IDP. You'll start doing the ARE. You'll pass everything. You submit the forms. Everything's fine. But there's a lot of things that can happen in life. You know, suddenly you're married and you got a kid, and your uh, spouse is moving to uh, you know some other state, and you're going with them. You know, like so. Okay, what are you going to do, right? So the idea here is just you know be be cognizant of what what the issues are and make sure that you understand what the state issues are, uh, especially if you're kind of not sure where you're going. Okay, and so just to finish it up, then once you've submitted your uh, your credentials to your state and they give you your license, Frank, as you talked about, you then have the choice to apply for NCARB certification. Uh, I which, always recommend that which, very strongly. Which yeah. is something you can choose to it's, do. So you it's can, harder to do it later yep, than it you, is to do it right away. Yeah. Which I think is kind of probably the principle of this entire process exactly. is just kind of just shut up and do it. You can, right. um, <laughs> you can glide right into certification after you become licensed in one of the states. Yep. If you postpone that that credential, you're going to have to furnish NCARB with all of your experience between the time you first got your license and the time you're applying for certification. And that sometimes is an onerous process and difficult to yeah. put that information together. And again, the, enti the purpose of NCARB certification is so that you can very easily um, essentially pull a license. If you're licensed, let's, let's say you're, in your example, if you're licensed in Illinois and you're NCARB certified, when you have that client from Georgia who says, hey, can you do some work in, in Georgia for me? Uh, do you have a Georgia license? You can say, yeah, I can get one in, in a couple of weeks or a week or a couple of days. Mm -hmm. It's very easy. Whereas if you don't have that, then you have to go through a, like an extremely elaborate process um, in order to, you know, to make uh, get, get that license, right? Yep. Okay. Um, so one thing, just uh, one of the things you said there, which I think is, is worth sort of taking a second on about the timing of when you want to take the ARE. Um, one of the things that people find is that, uh, and Frank alluded to this a little bit earlier, there was sort of a decision that the schools would be about the sort of conceptual ideas of architecture and that you would learn through the, this kind of apprenticeship slash IDP process about the specifics, about the, the kind of industry of architecture and the, how the contracts work and how the, you know, the construction administration works and things. And that split means that while you get a lot of this material in school, it's pretty hands off. And so uh, the exam is really focused on what it's like being an architect out in the world. Uh, and just as one quick example, 
you probably, when you're in school, didn't spend a lot of time designing parking lots. But you know, to pass the exam, you should understand how to design a parking lot. Um, so this is one of those things where there may be certain exams that make sense to take right away as you graduate, but other ones you probably want to get a little bit of experience. Everybody's going to have different kind of background. Uh, you know, I have some students who have been you know working for firms all the way through school or working for contractors all the way through school, and and they have a lot of background. And then when they graduate, they're ready to start taking the exam because they've got all this background. And other ones who you know for various reasons have very little work experience and are just you know kind of fresh. Uh, out, out of school and those folks probably doesn't make sense to dive right into to the ARE. You probably want to get at least some working experience before you start taking the exam. So this is just one more example to say uh, be strategic about it. Like think about well, who are you in that process. Um, if you're taking 4.0 and it's under this the current system, uh, a lot of folks think, well, you know, I took a lot of structures classes in school. Maybe I, I start with structures and I get those well, that's done. That's a great, great suggestion. Uh, I would recommend get, that Get too. that going. Because you, forget, you it, forget all those structural formulas right. by the time you're ready to take the test. Uh, and so that if may be a reason to, to, to start. And then, you know, maybe then you work for a year or two uh, and then take all the rest of them after you've had a little bit of experience. Do remember that there's the five-year rolling clock, so you don't want to take something and then wait 10 years because then it won't count. Um, but that idea that it, the, the exam is not really about what you learned in school generally, it's more about what you've learned in the practice out in the field. Absolutely, that's true. So guys, I have um, a question here from Omar. Uh, he asks, uh, so he, has uh, you know, but he has a, a a master's in architecture, a bunch of experience, but he never did the IDP process, um, and of course he's at the you know discouraged that even though he has six years of experience and has gone through this whole you know through this whole career, now he's got to go spend two to three years undertaking the IDP process in order to even begin taking the ARE exams. Can you guys comment on that? No, I think he's he's probably earned enough credit that he can get credit for. If he's worked for six years, he can go back five years and get half the credit. So half the credit is less than five years worth of experience. Yeah. As long as he's had a diversified experience, that's the key. Um, I would, but he's got to he's got to sign up for IDP. There's no there's no getting around that. There's no workaround for that. Yeah. Okay. But it will be a bit of a bureaucratic. He's going to have to set up and get going and make sure he's got all the information I, I about the five years. Done. It's totally I, I doable. Don't, I don't see that as a problem. Yeah. And the other thing to say is, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, this is very easy for me to say as somebody who's already, you know, down through this process and everything. Um, but you know, everybody thinks like, oh my God, I got to get through this right away, and you want to get through it right away, but you know. It, it, the fact that it takes another year or so, uh, that's fine. It's, you know, you, it'll be, you, you've got a long career ahead of you. It's all good. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and then one last question here. Of course, I'll take one more question if anyone has one here. Um, but Waleed uh, is asking, uh, you know, he's done a lot of uh, con uh, construction work with uh, Habitat for Humanity builds. And he's wondering if that would count for anything other than leadership and service, for example, you know, construction observation or something like that. Uh, I think in the newer versions, only if there's a licensed architect around. Is that right? No, no. I think he could, he can get construction observation experience, not necessarily working directly for an architect. Most of, of the leadership and there, there's a maximum number of hours you can get out of leadership and service, and it's pretty small. Um, so you can get it, it's just not a huge number of hours. Yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, 120 or something like that. I, Which is but, still 120 yeah. hours, so that's yeah. great. But yeah, yeah. yeah. but it's not, it, like that's, you're not going to be able to do all of your IDP through that or anything along no. those lines. No, you have to have a minimum of one year, roughly one year of experience, which is what, 1,200 and some hours, um, in working for an architect directly. Working. And I've had interns call me and they say, well, I've never worked for an architect. I had a guy that, that really, uh, the state was putting him through, through all kinds of problems. He had been licensed, but he let his license lapse. And so now he's let his license lapse. He has to prove that he's been working for an architect since he let it lapse. And he can't because he's not working for an architect, even though he had a license before. 
So watch out! Don't don't let your license lapse. Yeah, when he the, just when forgot you, to renew it. When you get the letter from the uh, <laughs> license board, do you pay it? Pay the bill right away. <laughs> kind of like get paying it done. for your license sticker on your car. You yeah, got to do that every year too. It's, it's very expensive. <laughs> it's not. not to do. It's not expensive to continue that. I mean, it's what sixty dollars a year, I think, or something. Right. It's not very much. Not too yeah. bad. Hey, we have one last question here uh, from Rishi, uh, and she's in one of these difficult situations. She's got a five-year uh, undergrad degree from abroad, followed by a two-year graduate degree from the U.S. that's not NAB accredited. Um, she's been working under um, several licensed architects since 2003, and she's wondering, you know, still need to go through the entire evaluation process? Mm -hmm. Basically, as it's, it's currently set up. As yeah, it's currently right. set up. Do you know, like, um, you know, would it be to, her, to, to their advantage to kind of wait? Uh, until yeah, it would be. Uh, I think if she waits a year, uh, things will, will get loosened up in that area so it's worth noting here though that that doesn't, not, no promises no there. promises there <laughs> like you know, that you, you might be doing is just waiting but having, year having and, seen how successful yeah. Michael Armstrong is in getting these changes implemented my guess is my bet would be that he's gonna push this one through too yeah that which means that you don't have to go through the evaluation process for your degree they give you credit for your degree and one of the things that I would say about uh, these sort of difficult ones, but also really for everybody, is uh, you know the, the folks at NCARB are actually really nice, on top of it, sort of good people. But we should give a shout out to Martin Smith, yeah, for being helpful with uh, with all of our interns. The, the, all the folks there, I've had really great relationships with those folks. They're they're really strong and and want to be helpful. They want to make uh, you know new architects out there. Um, but, and here's the sort of key part of it, you are in control. Like you need to make things happen. Uh, nobody is going to send in your IDP hours. You have to do it. Nobody is going to, like, if, if you haven't gotten the results back of the ARE exam you took, you find out what happened. There's all kinds of, you know, think about how big a country it is and all the different things going on. Who knows, right? There's all kinds of things that can be going wrong. Uh, and just... You find the person who can help you and then make it happen. Well, that's why there's also these licensing advisors like I am. Sure. And every school has them. Uh, many of the large firms have them as well. So that's, that's the role that we play as volunteers uh, to assist people in getting through this process. But you have to go find that person or call NCARB or do it. So, you know, people, I hear people come to me all the time and, and complain about, you know, oh, my situation is, well, have you talked to the... And like, well, no, I haven't. You know, like, you got to make it happen. There isn't anybody sitting in Washington D.C. going, oh, I wonder how Mark is doing. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, like, you have to tell them that there's a problem. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll end it there. So, uh, thank you, Mike, and thank you, Frank. Uh, thanks to everyone who's tuned in and who submitted their questions today. Um, as you can see on the screen here, if you'd like to attend our next ARE live broadcast where you'll be able to ask uh, Mike questions about the ARE, visit blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register to attend. Um, and just like today's episode, you'll have a chance to ask questions and share your answers with, with us for live feedback during the broadcast. And to learn more about our AIA ARE prep curriculum, go to blackspectacles.com where you can try out any of the free uh, course videos. And for those of you who are ready to start preparing for the ARE, so if you've already gone through IDP and you're ready to go, um, and you're, if you're already an AIA member, so you've taken Frank's good advice, um, as a part of our partnership with the AIA, you can visit um, the URL that you can see on the screen here, which is bksp.es slash IDP dash a N D dash A R E. It just uh, rolls off the tongue. There it is. Uh, to get a 15% discount for the entire duration of your AIA A R E prep membership. Finally, please leave a comment below the video to let us know what you think and share any suggestions you may have. I promise we'll read every word that you write and use them to tune our next episodes. So thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.